Hi, my name is Moki Makura and I am the host of Women on Top, the Africa edition. It's a podcast show where we interview successful African women in leadership roles, and I'm here to guide you through their stories. Every episode, we'll meet one of these fabulous women who clawed their way to the top, hunched through that glass ceiling, covered up their cuts and bruises, and today, they are standing strong. This is Women on Top, the Africa edition. People don't believe it now. They're like, how did you get this crazy idea, which is so big? We've come from when we were in a room sitting on a boardroom table to having over 40 employees in this huge factory buildings. This episode, we meet Monica Masonda, a Zambian entrepreneur in the food manufacturing business. I was on a plane and someone asked me, what do I do? And I said, oh, you know, I run a, a food manufacturing business. And then he asked me, what's the name of the restaurant? And I thought, wow, okay. <laughs> That he could think I was running a restaurant and not a, like a, a manufacturing business. And I mean, you couldn't even hate the guy. That was in his mind. That's just what women can do. And I know it's a story of many women where you just be taken seriously to be seen that your business is not a hobby and that it will actually will succeed. And succeed she has. Monica has definitely proved that guy on the plane wrong. But she wasn't always in the food business. And at one point, she knew very little about the industry she was destined to enter. I was very much a corporate lawyer chasing corporate deals for 16 years of my life. In my last position as a lawyer, I worked for a manufacturing conglomerate. And I almost wish that I had um, had the idea before I left, because maybe I would have got some experience working with them in a different uh, part of the business aside from law, to really have appreciated the, you know, the complexities of running a manufacturing business. Pity she didn't pay more attention, because back then, the manufacturing conglomerate she worked for was owned by the Nigerian billionaire, Aliko Dangote, who's not only one of the richest men on the continent, but also one of its biggest manufacturers of food. But Monica had another advantage. I come from Zambia, and Zambia is, apart from mining, grows a lot of commodities. So we grow maize, wheat, soya bean very, very well. We have no uh, industry around us. And I felt what a great opportunity to be one of the first to use what was locally grown to create a food product. And I thought it was that easy. I thought, you know, I don't know why no one else has done it. So why not, right? So that was fundamentally why I chose food. And one thing we all know for the African continent, Zambian uh, also not excluded, is that we're a big importer of foreign produced foods. And I was really looking to change that narrative with Java Foods. Today, Java Foods is by far the largest manufacturer of food in Zambia and one of the largest in the region, excluding South Africa. Her factory has a huge capacity and is currently churning out 100,000 packets of noodles per eight-hour shift. Her annual turnover is in excess of a million dollars a year and she has now expanded into other food products. We have built great Zambian brands that people are very proud of. Not just in Zambia, we export into the region, we export into Zimbabwe and now into Malawi. We are also really, really proud of the fact that we've got a state-of-the-art factory. When I look at the factory, I almost can't believe it. It is a beautiful, beautiful factory, which will be internationally certified at the end of the year. We've come from when we were in a room sitting on a boardroom table to having over 40 employees in this huge factory buildings. I have over 40 employees who are very dedicated to Java and what we do. Very proud that we have like people who have been with me from the beginning, you know, who trusted uh, my crazy ideas and my leadership and the tough times and are still with me. That makes me proud that I have got such a great team. But like any entrepreneurial journey, it hasn't always been an easy one. But Monica has made it over the five-year mark, which is the point when nearly half of all new businesses fail. We've been running now almost 10 years and uh, it's been quite a journey, actually. It's um, a labor of love, that's for sure. <laughs> In some cases, it's, it has felt like it's been long. Um, definitely didn't think it was going to take so long for it to become profitable or to become a, at scale. I, In my mind, when I first started, I thought it would be a much shorter journey. I think uh, definitely that it is not a sprint. I think it, I was a bit naive in the beginning to think that, you know, in three or four years time, this will be easy because you, you underestimate the difficulties in running a business, setting up a business, the market. And I just thought I had a business plan over five years and five years I was going to cash out and I was going to do something else. I was going to move somewhere else, etc. And it was very much not like that. I wish someone had said to me, as much as it's a great idea, are you prepared for the long haul? But I really love what Monica says next. Not many people are comfortable talking about failure. 
we failed a lot in our first few years. We failed a lot to get product out, to have product. We failed to get money, to pay workers. It took a long time to then actually see, you know, my fifth year when someone actually came, stopped me in the supermarket to say, oh, you Monica, you know, all my, my kids only eat easy noodles. How did you think about the idea? And I was like, yeah, how did I think about this idea? Because people don't believe it now. They're like, how did you get this crazy idea, which is so big now? It's random moments like that. The acknowledgement of a stranger in a supermarket that made her realize it was all worth it. But there are other moments, those moments that almost take you out at the knees. I remember leaving Zambia to go to London for my TEDx Houston talk. And we were about to sign with a venture capital fund based in Denmark. Basically go on the plane thinking, okay, it's done. By the time I come back, I will sign and the business will get a little bit more funding, which means for 2016, we'll be pretty okay. I have no worries. And I'm going to speak about this great business at TEDx. So this is really great. I got this text message which said, uh, we have changed our mind. We're no longer willing to support Java. My heart sank. I was literally in the immigration line and I was in this panic because I was like, what does this mean? I mean, this, this is 2015 and I have no second option. Everything was riding on these guys, right? We don't have money to enter 2016. I am actually here in London to speak about this great business and how well we're doing and our future plans. And I just don't have it in me anymore to continue. You know, I don't know if you know the saying when you're up Shit's Creek without a paddle. And that's how I felt. Like I had really gone further down the river and I then realized I got into trouble and I had nothing. The options at that time was to shut down the business because I, I just did not know how I was going to come back to pay employees, rent, obligations. I just did not know where what was going to happen. And it was a lonely time. Big people expected a good, a good story. I mean, I think I gave a good story, but didn't really go into details at the time that we were really uncertain about our future at that time. And then I got back and basically went back to the drawing board and really um, just made the business very, very lean. But I remember vividly at that time in the line at Heathrow thinking to myself, you know what? This is a sign. You've tried. There's no value in this business anymore. So let's just, you know, call it a day and let me just get a job. Well, thank goodness she didn't go and find a job. One funder had turned her down, but they weren't the only ones. My biggest challenge was raising enough funding uh, as we grew. I, uh, definitely the market was there and it was the market was demanding for products and I just couldn't raise enough money. Um, I didn't know how. The business was not mature enough to raise enough money from banks or venture capital in the early stages. I think that for me was very challenging and very stressful for me because a lot of it had to be self-funded. After a while, goodwill dries up and you just have to keep on going. And I think for me, that was really, really difficult. And there were other moments. When you can't pay yourself and you can't pay your, you know, you owe so many people money and it's just not working out the way you wanted. Even after, this is like three or four years, it's still not making sense. And then you begin to question, is it really ever going to be a business? You know, I remember that was very difficult for me, really questioning, is it really going to be able to scale? And am I, am I doing the right thing? I knew there was a lot of self-doubt. And then there was the issue of gender. Monica told me one of the most frustrating things for her was... Sometimes being doubted as a woman. I mean, I remember finally, finally getting my first overdraft after two and a half years, um, using my house as collateral. Here in, in, in Zambia, you have to, there isn't an unsecured overdraft for business. And I think they gave us $150,000 overdraft, uh, which was great year three and four. When I got to year five and six, when we were doing way, way more in revenue and the bank wouldn't give me more money. And I just couldn't understand why they wouldn't take a, more of a risk on me. And someone just said, well, you know, um, you're just not a proven entrepreneur, um, meaning maybe you're just not a man. And there you have it. It's sad and surprising that being a woman is still seen as a barrier to running a successful business. The Mastercard Index of Women Entrepreneurs, which was published in 2020, showed that the top three countries in the world with the most female entrepreneurs were in Africa. <laughs> Uganda, Botswana and Ghana specifically. The US was ranked fourth and Russia was fifth. The world is simply going to have to get used to having more women making decisions in business.
when you walk in to, uh, to see a customer, and my sales managers have, have always been men and you've taken them and they are addressing him and they're assuming that you're just there for color maybe. And then uh, he, my sales manager is very, very embarrassed because you know, the customer is addressing him. And, and this often happens with the big supermarkets, by the way, and they're addressing him and he's very embarrassed. You can see him, he's very shifty. And he said, but maybe you want to actually speak to my boss. <laughs> So would it have been easier if I was a man? Maybe. Um, definitely manufacturing is very male dominated. Uh, maybe the you know the old boy club would have made it easier for me to get supplies, easier on rent, et cetera. But I don't really know. I just do know that uh, we've kept going. Uh, and despite how long and how difficult it's been, I think it'll be easier for the women behind me. That's for sure. <laughs> I think people will be now used to seeing more women in manufacturing in Zambia. Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. That's a quote from Warren Buffett that really resonates for me. I love the fact that Monica is aware of the legacy she's leaving for other women in her country. So in her free time, Monica mentors women entrepreneurs and is often called on to speak about entrepreneurship. And one thing she knows and shares for sure is this. The one thing I do know, and I often say this to people who are starting businesses, is that, you know, don't spend too much time on, you know, the business plan. Obviously, interrogate the business and understand what you're going to do, but do let the markets teach you because it's not what you think it is. I remember when I first started, I made lots of assumptions about even how to sell the product and how to get paid. And the market was very different. That was in the beginning. And even simple things like making sure expiry dates are long enough because some food is not sold, particularly processed food, takes a while to get off the shelf. So you need to have a long enough shelf life. The things which you don't even think about when you start the business, but every year you learn because the market teaches you. Monica is also learning and appreciating what she brings to the business. She's using the attributes that are more typically associated with being a woman to her advantage. I think we're definitely more, more empathetic. Someone said to me, oh, but you always ask how your family is. And I didn't think it was anything, but you know, you always say, oh, how are you? How is your family? And the, the guys said, oh, where I used to work before, they never cared. So it was something, but I never thought about it. I definitely agree that being a woman has helped. Well, some people believe, and I have seen this happen in my career, that powerful women don't often lift up other women. In Margaret Thatcher's 11 years as Prime Minister of England, she only appointed one, just one cabinet minister. On the other hand, Joyce Bander, the president of Malawi between 2009 and 2012, appointed eight women to her cabinet. So where does Monica stand on this issue? So our board is 50-50. We, I have three women on the board already. And of course, the company is run by me. My leadership team, which is a, a team of six, we are also 50-50, so which is really encouraging. We find that there's some departments where we're really top women heavy. So the finance department, top women heavy. The quality control department, very uh, top women heavy. Then we go into production and we see very male heavy. And uh, But it's something we have focused on. We, are, we take our managers through training, so how to recruit, how to focus on getting uh, even to keep women because it's also about retaining women in certain positions as well to understand some of the problems or the challenges that women uh, go through. So we've had to be very deliberate in our approach because our goal is this year, one of our KPIs is to be 40% as Java, 40% should be women, right? Across the board. And we are now sitting at 36. So we've heard about Monica's successes. We've heard about some of her failures and many of her challenges. But what sort of a leader is she? Before I ran the business, I lived in Nigeria. So it was very go-getting, very, I was like controlling, really wanted to control outcomes. Very, you know, you you, you worked really hard. And I, I brought that kind of culture to my business, but realized very quickly that I was dealing obviously with a different uh, culture of people. I am very, very aggressive in terms of my approach and the way I push people. But now I really believe in uh, hiring the, the very best and leaving, the, you know, sitting down agreeing what needs to be done and expecting the result. And you, but, but you need to deliver, right? So before I would then have micromanaged it and checking on it all the time. I was that kind of leader to make sure the result I wanted was, you know, was I, I got that result. And now I, it's actually much better this time because I think I used to stress myself too much about it. So now I'm much more about making sure we, I have professionals around me who give me advice. Um, 
I will interrogate that advice and allowing the person to actually achieve the result or even fail. I'm actually discussing the failure, right? But it's, it's really been a lesson, you know, how you can, how you grow a business is not about you as the, the founder. It's about the team and you have to empower the team accordingly, get the right people to win. And it really has changed the way I, I run the business, how I am a leader. So I'm much more inclusive. I'm much more, to some extent, willing to listen to others. Um, there are some pretty smart people who work for me. I don't always agree with them, but I let them do what they need to do. And it's really great to hear that Monica has been inspired by other women. I worked very well with Irene Chanley, um, who was an MTN uh, executive, and now she runs Smile uh, Technologies. And I loved working with her. She was so inspirational for me because she was such a go-getter. And I sat in, in meetings with her, very, very focused, uh, was very confident. And although she did not have a background in telecom, she was like a sponge. She would know everything. She knew her numbers very well. She knew how to be prepared. She knew when to turn on the pressure, turn it off. And I remember being in meetings thinking, I love this sort of high-powered, focused, respected type of woman. And that was in my early days. And now, you know, um, as I run my own business, I have a different type of focus. You know, I look on the continent, a number of women who have started uh, businesses in sectors which are very male-dominated. I don't know them personally, but very inspired by their stories. So there's a lady, Divine, who runs a security company in Zimbabwe. And if you listen to her story and read about what she has done, she's very, very inspirational. And you can't talk to a woman without talking about appearance. Countless studies have shown that women are judged on their looks and appearance far more harshly than men. So do you remember the male Australian TV anchor who wore the same blue suit for a year to prove his point that his female co-presenter was judged more harshly and often just for her appearance? At the time, he was quoted as saying, I'm judged on my interviews on how I do my job, basically. Whereas women are quite often judged on what they are wearing or how their hair is. Let's get Monica's take on this. Coming from the legal profession, I, it was a very big thing for me. I think I got into a runt because things were quite difficult and I became very, you know, let's say fair about sort of like a, jeans and flat shoes. And then I had my daughter and so it also made things a little difficult because it's just like you just, that was the last thing on my mind is how I looked. But then the pandemic hit and then I said to myself, you have to actually be very, with everything you do in your life, appearance included, because it has an effect on how you feel and how you look and how you portray yourself, you know? If you look good and you feel that you look good, you're more likely to succeed, to, to get through a hard day, uh, to think differently. And that's how I take it now. So now actually I put a lot more effort in, in looking better. <laughs> Because I've been through a few years of just like wearing sneakers to work and not really caring. And now I don't. And now everyone says, oh, did you have a meeting? I'm like, no, I just went to work. <laughs> so I will wear you know, heels and wear a very nice dress and, you know, a string of pearls and do my hair because I want to feel as good as I look, you know, and it, it really does help keep me going. Monica has a daughter, Amara. And women are often the designated caregivers when it comes to raising kids. So I asked her how she coped with motherhood and leadership with her four-year-old daughter. She's a child we really waited for. And she was also a very conscious decision for me because I was running the business like, you know, really, really pushing the business. But it was something I really wanted to do. I really wanted to be a mom. And it meant I needed to get off the, you know, the bike. And I needed to look after myself in order for me to have her and take some time off. She was born and for the first, I think, 18 months, I traveled everywhere with her. In fact, if you look at her passport, I think, you know, it's quite embarrassing to show all these stamps, but I wouldn't leave her at home. And I was very clear with people I would work with, if I was speaking at a conference, that I come with my child and my nanny. And this is very, she's too small for me to leave her at home. So it's very important that you make arrangements for her as well. And I think when you're upfront like that, people really appreciate that. And they make a decision very quickly whether or not they want you to come or not. I'm mean, very, very fortunate. Everyone has taken it very positively when I'm up front like that. But I can tell you, it's definitely not easy. I am fortunate that I'm in my home country and um, my parents are both alive and well. And so everyone chips in to raise my child. We, it really does take a village. And um, I'm so fortunate. I can attest to that. I have seen Monica with her small entourage and I've always admired the choices she made in fitting her life around her child rather than the other way around. But how does she balance her time? 
So I, I'm fully on the business uh, when I'm in the office and until I leave. And then I would tell them if I leave at four, I'm not available between four and seven. Um, I would get back on my computer. So if anything you want me to approve, please send it, but expect a response later. Most people are fine with that. I think what, what, what the biggest issue is the lack of communication that, that, you know, you sort of disappear from your desk and no one sees you until tomorrow morning. And they're like, but I was looking for you. But I find even external people to say, sorry, I can't take a call between these hours. Happy to take the call at 9.30. It doesn't mean you work longer hours. It is, it's exhausting, right? But what's really good also about that, it also shows people in my office that they too can also be very flexible, that we have the flexibility as long as you get the work done when you say you're going to do it. Being the primary caregiver for children is not the only thing that disproportionately impacts women in the workplace. There is this other thing. You may not have come across the phrase, but if you've been in any sort of leadership or higher profile role, you'll almost definitely recognize the feeling called imposter syndrome. The dictionary definition says it's the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's efforts or skills. In a nutshell, it's feeling like a fraud. Imposter syndrome affects women more than men and women of color in particular. According to a 2020 study by KPMG, 75% of the women they polled said they had experienced imposter syndrome. I put it to Monica. I get it all the time. Particularly, I've, I've found this where I have been very fortunate to be appointed on, on uh, corporate boards for listed businesses. Monica is a dual qualified English solicitor and Zambian advocate, so she's a popular choice for corporate boards. She's on the board of Airtel Network Zambia and Zambia Breweries, where she's a chair, and she previously served on the boards of the Central Bank of Zambia, Dangote Industries, and she was the chairperson of the Kwacha Pension Trust Fund, which is Zambia's largest single employer pension fund. You almost have to pinch yourself, like, you know, I don't understand what they're saying, but should I even be here <laughs> kind of thing? But also, um, you grow up really quickly because I, I fundamentally believe that women need to be in boardrooms and it means that you have to grow up. You've got to, you've got to learn very quickly, understand how it plays out. So now a lot less, but that's because I've had a lot more experience. My interactions with large businesses have had really good mentors, but both men and women who kind of help gravitate you through these doubts. So I know it's, it happens to the best of us, right? It still happens. Even when I'm, I'm, I've been asked to speak on a, on, a, on a particular topic as an expert, and you're like, but I'm not an expert, actually. So, But um, getting better. I think it's worth pointing out here that she is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, as well as a Tutu Fellow. In 2017, she was a recipient of the African Agribusiness Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Outstanding Achievement in Agricultural Input. Forbes magazine and Africa Investor named her as one of the leading young power women in business in Africa in both 2013 and 2014. She's also a nutrition advocate and sits on the Scaling Up Nutrition Global Advisory Board. Even in the way she has responded to the pandemic, which blindsided so many businesses with thousands shutting their doors. But even just coming out of COVID, I've learned so much about what a crisis, a pandemic can do to a business and how you must think differently. In a way, we've come out stronger because we had a really big crisis, but you're, we're much more resilient now to something like that where we think differently. What we learned very quickly is that you can't have all your eggs in one basket. Particularly in Africa, you need a basket of different goods uh, to sell to the consumer. You really need to diversify uh, your income. It was a curveball, definitely not expected. We just thought it was over somewhere else in China and then it affected us. Uh, not badly in terms of numbers at first, but because we all shut down in reaction to the pandemic, which no one could have thought about, right? So it was, it was an interesting time. And now, I mean, you were so much more resilient or really pushing ahead, uh, really thinking now much more about product development, ensuring that we have a whole basket of food uh, that we can now sell to the consumer. And that's the test of a true entrepreneur and an African woman. It's your ability to pivot and survive even when the world throws you a curved ball. And that's why Monica Musonda is a woman on top. And that's it from me, Moki Makura. I'm your host and the producer of Women on Top, the Africa edition. It's the podcast where we interview African women in leadership roles. If you like this podcast, please share it. Subscribe and tell us what you think in the comments. We will see you next time.